Okay, I'm very excited to film this video today. A little while ago, I asked you guys for submissions, for pieces, for excerpts that we could edit on this channel together in a video. If you're new here, I've done this many times now on my own writing and um, I thought I would see if you guys were interested in kind of making this sort of like open workshop type of video and you guys really came through. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get more than like four or five submissions like i was just gonna leave the form open for like a couple days but um there were more submissions than i anticipated we can't get to them all in this one video i picked the submissions just on based on just like when they were submitted so i did read all of the pieces but just for like just to be fair i'm just gonna go through like the first maybe three or four that were submitted. If your piece isn't in this video, it has nothing to do with how much I enjoyed it or anything like that. I literally just picked based on um, timing. Just before we jump into it, it's, this is gonna be a little bit different than my usual edit with me videos. I wanted to make sure that I was giving feedback that would actually be um, helpful. We're not gonna be line editing every single piece. I only kind of did line edits on the pieces that specifically requested feedback on the prose. The other thing is that line edits that I did are not suggestions or anything. They're mostly there for examples. As I kind of make comments and just give my own personal impressions of the story, um, sometimes I just do the line edits just to illustrate a point and not necessarily because I think that that is what the writer should do. So yeah, I just want to make that very, very clear. That is my huge long disclaimer um again to the writers thank you so so much for submitting and for trusting me with your work and for letting me do this video with your writing it goes without saying but feel free to take and discard any of this feedback as you guys see fit let's get into it This is historical fiction, YA novel excerpt. Feedback was on prose, tone, general impressions, and this takes place in an alternate Greek-inspired kingdom. Main character has a huge secret that gets revealed. At this point in the story, the two characters in the scene have a tight-knit friendship, and in the section prior, they had fallen asleep beside each other while they were talking. Okay, so I did do a little bit of line editing again not because this is necessarily me suggesting that this is what the writer should do but more um as you know when i talk through the points this is just as an example to show one way that um, you could approach it but there are a million ways that you can make these edits it's quite the mess the bright crimson spot soaked into the cloth that draped over the mattress a humiliating sight for her to be fair, however, whenever her time was to come and it drenched her bed in clothes, she'd be all right with that in the privacy of her home, but alas, she is in the barracks with the general of the army. Okay, so I was immediately so intrigued by this. Let's start at the beginning though, um, present tense. When I first saw the present tense, I was like, I love present tense, <laughs> especially present tense um, outside of the context of like, contemporary present tense of fantasy, present tense sci-fi, present tense historical fiction. I'm a big, big fan. However, I did notice that there was inconsistencies in the verb tense. So we start in present tense, but then it kind of dips into past tense, back into present tense, and then other parts of the excerpt are also in past tense. Yeah, when you're going through the draft, keep an eye out for verb tenses because I have had this happen to me where I start writing in present tense but then my brain switches back. Personally, I think that to, to be on the safer side, pre um, past tense is usually easier to write. Whichever one you pick is fine. The sentence here, the bright crimson spots soaked into the cloth that draped over the mattress, a humiliating sight for her. I would say in a line edit, you can really just simplify this. You don't have to say the cloth that draped over the mattress. You can just say something like the bed cloth, um, a humiliating sight for her. It's fine to state this, but I think you can also, it is dipping a little bit into the show don't tell rule where we are telling the reader that this is a humiliating sight for her when I don't think we necessarily need to actually say that it was humiliating because if we actually look at what is happening 
um, my impression is that she has just woken up and gotten her period uh, while she is in the presence of someone else. Implicitly, that situation can be very, very humiliating for someone, you know? We don't actually need to necessarily state that if we can paint the picture that she is very nervous about the situation, you know? Um, the other phrase that I pointed out here was whenever her time was to come. My impression of this sentence was that um, it's supposed to allude to the fact that this is her period and that um, this is her time of the month. Saying her time of the month might be a little bit too modern, so I wouldn't recommend that line edit. When we say what someone's time is to come or someone's time has come, um, it sounds very like grandiose and it doesn't really fit with the tone of what is happening here because whenever we say that kind of phrase, we're usually alluding to some kind of like death or destiny or something. So it's it's very grand sounding and I feel like it doesn't, it kind of stands out here and sounds a little bit strange. Um, but I do agree with the idea that you should um, imply the fact that this is her period without necessarily saying that it's her period. I do think that that is an important thing to do. Then it goes on to say she'd be all right with that in the privacy of her home. So all right is a bit colloquial. Um, it's a bit modern. I know that this is a historical fiction um, I don't know if saying all right is necessarily, again, I'm making an assumption here because I haven't actually read the entire piece, but um, I would watch out for stuff like that, like colloquialisms that might sound a bit modern or out of place in your world building. Um, okay, and then it says that she is in the barracks with the general of the army. I was so intrigued. I actually really like the premise of this scene, like the concept of this woman getting her period when she's supposed to be disguised as a man. Um, that's what we kind of learn as the scene goes on. I honestly, for like, just to talk about general impressions of like the events of the scene, I think that there is a lot of interesting um, tension to be extracted from that plot point. There's a lot you could do with that on a character level. I'm assuming that this is something that the character or this is something that the story is building towards prior to this scene and so what we're reading is maybe the result of something like this secret that the main character has been harboring for some period of time and this is like the moment where it kind of culminates, you know? On paper I actually really really like the concept of this scene. Here in blue I just kind of wrote out an alternative way of approaching the opening. One approach that I had here was saying uh, Callista woke to the smell of blood, her own. You could definitely keep the phrase, it's quite the mess, but this is an alternative option to consider where you're kind of starting something that the reader can more tangibly feel. Because I think uh, the smell of blood and specifically your period, it's one of the most like jarring smells that you can ever experience, you know? I think a lot of us can sort of like relate to what the feeling of smelling blood is like. And I think there's a certain like drama to um, waking up to the smell of your own blood. For anyone who has ever had a period, <laughs> most of us can relate to the feeling of realizing that you've gotten your period at a really inopportune time. For the rest of the description here, I wrote, it soaked through the bedcloth like the remains of a horrible wound. The sight would have not horrified her so if she were alone, but alas, she had gotten too careless, forgetting to count the days the general lay just across the barracks. Going back to what I was saying earlier about painting the picture, this is a humiliating sight for the character um, rather than simply stating it. Personally, I don't even think that you need to say that it was humiliating. I shortened this description, the cloth that draped over the mattress to just the bed cloth, and I kind of chose to use just like a dipping into a little bit of figurative language and I know that likening the blood stain to a wound doesn't give exactly the same connotation as calling it humiliating. However, I do think that it attributes a certain type of negative connotation that we are trying to build in this scene because thinking of your period blood as a wound it kind of attaches this sense of guilt and just a bit more a more of an, an aggressive feeling to it which i thought kind of felt um kind of matched the tone of the scene i also simplified um this section here and i just said the site would not have horrified her so if she were alone just to make it clear that this is her period 
Um, I'm assuming that because she has been disguising herself this entire time that she would be trying to track her period like mentally in her head. Here she had maybe gotten too careless and forgotten that it was coming. So the scene goes on. Callista ripped her gaze away from the mess now that she managed to swing her legs off the edge of the bed rising from it quickly like a bird lifting off into the horizon. When describing actions, simple actions, just things like standing up from a bed, sitting down, walking across the room, it usually is more effective to be as concise as possible. There are exceptions to this, but in general, if it's just an indication, you know, what the character is doing and it's not um, necessarily integral to the scene, you don't necessarily need to write all of it out. You know, as writers, I think we feel the need to like want to describe every little thing, but oftentimes what is most uh, interesting to the reader when it comes to these kinds of descriptions um, is things that move the plot forward, descriptions that immerse the reader more into the atmosphere or the setting. Three, descriptions that reveal something about a character. Everything else that's not sort of contributing to those main things, oftentimes, not always, oftentimes, can be concise and you can really simplify them. The other thing about this figurative language here, my rule of thumb with figurative language is to think about intention first. So if you're saying that she's rising from the bed, why is that? She wants to stand up quickly because she's um, worried, scared, nervous, and maybe she's trying to um, get rid of the evidence as fast as possible. If you want to use a metaphor to emphasize that, the metaphor should be crafted with those goals in mind. I think the connotation of birds and flight is something that I personally associate more with um, something positive like um, freedom or escape. The tone of that kind of description, it feels a little unbalanced here. Other writers can feel free to disagree with me in this moment, um, but that was just like my reading of it. I was a little bit um, surprised by it. So one option that you could do here is um, just saying she rose quickly, her garment clung to her thighs, blood half dried and crusting on her skin. She needed to strip the bedding before anyone aroused. I kind of went in this direction because I thought it would be an interesting thing to consider trying to focus on the feeling of the blood on her body. Like when you think of bleeding through your clothes, that's like one of the most uncomfortable feelings that you can have when you get your period. And I just think kind of immersing the reader a little bit more in that discomfort can sort of like push the tension of the scene forward. And then I added this here just kind of as a something that would keep the urgency of the scene. Obviously, you know, she wants to get rid of the evidence before this person, the other character wakes up. So that kind of keeps the ball moving in the scene. So again, you don't need to make these changes, but it's just something that I, I wrote to illustrate my point. So then the character wakes up and I'm assuming that this is the name that Callista is using as her like alter ego. Um, I love this. I love that he wakes up just as she discovers that she has bled through the night. I'm just gonna like quickly run through some of the points that I noticed when I was reading through the piece. It says this is when the feeling as if a load of large stones were just released onto her head tackled her. So this imagery is a bit muddled here. Um, the phrasing kind of threw me off because there is a lot of different imagery that is being used in just this one phrase. Pinpricks, we have a load of large stones released and then tackled. I'd focus on just one. I would kind of try to simplify this sentence and just focus on one or two of the main sensations. I don't even actually think that you need to say all of this. Um, I'm just gonna quickly move down um, throughout the scene just for the sake of time. So one thing that I noticed about the dialogue is that there's no dialogue tags or no indication of who is speaking at what time. I know that there's only two characters in the scene and it's pretty, it's pretty easy to follow who is speaking, um, but I would consider indicating who is speaking a little bit, even if it's not she said, he said. I think that you can do a lot with how you play around with dialogue, and I'll get to that when we talk about the end of the scene. Um, his grip tightened and Callista winced, yanking her wrist from his caustic grip. It happened too quickly. The woman barely had time to process the way he manhandled her, moving to rip the front of her clothes apart with just his bare hands. He tore apart the binders of her chest and cold air brushed against the skin of her bosom as the ripped clothes now hung off her waist. Callista wrapped her arms around her 
naked torso, keeping her eyes on the floor. Okay, um, so this is a this is very much like a a boiling point moment here. First of all, the woman you can just say she. There are only two characters in the scene. Process uh, the way he manhandled her. So again, I don't think you need to say this because it's implied in the rest of the description that he is in fact manhandling her. So this is like a bit of a redundant phrase. If I were to suggest a line edit, I would suggest just simplifying the actions a little bit here. It happened too quickly. He lunged, ripping her chitin down to her waist, tearing apart her chest binding. The cold air brushed her naked skin. She covered herself with her arms, eyes fixed to the ground. So it's the exact same description, just trimming the fat a little bit. What I really did like about this um, description though was how visceral it felt. Um, I'm assuming it's supposed to be this like huge dramatic moment, a moment where Callista or the main character is really being confronted. Okay, I'm just gonna cut down to this little section here. This reads as a POV shift. Adrionis could almost see red as he beheld the woman before him. There was the feeling of his throat closing up that he absolutely despised with every fiber of his being. I would watch out for this because the entire scene has been, we've been in Callista's point of view. So when you're describing like what he's feeling, like his throat closing up, and you're jumping into his head. It can be quite confusing for a reader. If you want to describe how the other character is feeling, I would recommend a scene break because it can be quite confusing for a reader. I'm not saying it's never been done, and I don't like to say that there are um, hard rules that you should follow as a writer, but it is something to be aware of. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is dialogue. Um, no dialogue tags. None of the scene has had dialogue tags, which is fine, but I just kind of want to point something out here. So taking this phrase where Callista says, Adrionis, I can explain everything, please. With the exact same dialogue, I kind of laid it out differently. So one option you could do is saying, Adrianas, she shivered, I can explain. So taking out the everything, please, Callista will sound a little, she'll come across a little bit less begging. Like, I don't know what her personality is, but if she has a more hard, stubborn, strong personality, um, maybe you can cut out the everything, please, depending on how much guilt she feels in the moment. If you do want to keep the everything in the please, another way that you could write the dialogue is Adrionis, I can explain everything. She shivered, please. Um, so throwing in an M dash here implies a bit of a stutter or a pause. And the reason that I put in this little indicator, there's a there's just like a bit of a different rhythm to it. Like as a reader, if I'm reading, if you're splitting up your dialogue and you're putting it in two sections, like mentally when we're reading that phrase, we're gonna pause. I know it's a it seems like a tiny thing, but when you split up your dialogue like this and you have some kind of in like action indicator in between the natural pause that the reader will get from reading means that in our head we're kind of gonna punctuate the second phrase and so it feels like there's a little bit more weight to saying please that's just something to consider it's a very very tiny thing so overall for the pros i think um one thing to just watch out for is asking yourself if there are any redundancies in the descriptions and the other main thing is i would recommend being in only one character's perspective at a time for tone i like the tone i really like historical fiction in general um i think like ancient greece is an is a great setting. I also really like the core conflict of this scene. I think that this could actually, you know, if you if you get in and revise it, I think that it could be a really, really um, great character focused scene with a lot of tension and drama. So yeah, I would keep playing around with it. This is a flash fiction submission. So this was a super fun piece to read. This part here, immediately when I read this, I uh, felt very like Saunders-esque. It immediately has that kind of like absurdist tone. You're like entrenched into this very strange like situation. My coworker Daryl leans over my shoulder, breathing stagnant coffee water into the right side of my face. I just highlighted this because I really liked it. I feel like uh, this like immediately gave me an impression of who this Daryl character is. I don't know you just had to type something. You said you're an aspiring author. Come on now, aspire me. It's quite hard to do characterization in flash fiction, so any way that you can kind of like squeeze it into the short word count is 
pretty impressive. Um, that's not what aspiration is. And besides, we're on the clock and I've still got hundreds of patient forms to process. Dr. Humber is on my case as it is. Daryl storms out of my cubicle, then 10 seconds later walks back in. This is the most boring job ever. Why are we processing these forms? So that patients don't die. Um, I actually really like this detail. He's shouting nonsense. I think you could even be like a little bit more specific here. You could say he Daryl wanders away again and Daryl wanders away again. Uh, he's shouting. I even like something like that. Or, or, he mutters to himself in his cubicle. Which is kind of like, th like this kind of harkens back to um, what the narrator was writing up at the start. Yeah, because I was like, you know, if he's shouting nonsense, I want to know what nonsense he's shouting, you know? I feel like that could sort of contribute to uh, his character and also just the tone of the piece overall. I forget to double check the details before I click send. Lo and behold, the copy I've sent to Dr. Humber has at least three errors. Who is this total stranger I just screwed over? For legal reasons, I won't put his name here. We can just call him Schrodinger. He's already dead. Then again, maybe he isn't. I really like this. What's my name? I just realized that in telling this story, not once did I name myself. This is the paragraph that follows whatever I just said. Daryl is sort of right. This job does a number on your mental clarity. Okay, so overall, I, I think I really like the tone of the piece. I want more hints about the job though. Like, I don't know exactly the context of what they're actually doing. And I think if I had just a little bit more detail about that, the piece would feel much more rounded out. Like overall, just to speak on the tone, I love that it feels a bit off kilter. I love that it feels a little bit absurd. It definitely has a comedic bend that I really, really liked. I think it does work well as a short piece, but if you were to expand upon it, yeah, I'd just like to know a little bit more about the nature of the job and the allusions to how the work disrupts their sanity had me very intrigued. I don't know if there is a speculative element to this piece. If you want to go in that direction, I feel like this would kind of lend itself really well to just having like that one little odd speculative element. Like when I was reading over it, I at first got a bit of a, yeah, like George Saunders, like Pastoralia type vibe. Like there's just something about a lot of like Saunders's stories that it's just like, it's just a little bit weird. That it's just a little bit odd. Like it's our world, but just one beat off. But yeah, just one thing to consider. I also feel like it would be interesting to have a bit more of a ramp up or even an expansion on the moment where the narrator is like really feeling his sanity slipping in this last sort of paragraph. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is also just playing with form. So when I was reading it, I was getting a little bit confused by these these interjections where the narrator is sort of saying, I'm the man writing the sentence. This is the sentence that I'm writing and stuff like that. I don't know if this is going to be very helpful for what you have in mind for the piece, but um, one thing that you could consider is maybe putting these um, interjections into italics. So I kind of just like laid out the piece as if um, like with those kind of italics. So when you're reading it, kind of feel like these interjections are um, sort of a separate voice from the narrator's just regular internal monologue, if that makes sense. Maybe might play into um, the whole thing about like the mental clarity. So here, this is how it's originally formatted. And all I did was I kind of just took these two phrases, put them in italics, and there, it kind of gives, like visually, there's like some separation there. And then I also kind of took this end section, put that in italics as well. I don't know if that's like what the writer really has in mind for the story, but um, that was just something that kind of popped into my head. I think with like shorter pieces like this, you can really do some fun things, how it like visually re reads and looks on the page. All right, I think we can only get to one more excerpt for today. Feedback direction is on prose and general impressions and I believe they said that this was a novel, the start of a novel. Okay, uh, these woods were haunted or at least that's what the rumor was. Elle's dad told her that students would sneak out of their dorms on a dare only to run back minutes later babbling about cold hands wrapped around their necks or shadowy figures hidden between tree trunks. Haunted woods! I'm here for it. I'm assuming that this is a contemporary fantasy piece. I love it. Spooky vibes. I'm 
I'm here for the spooky vibes. Just to talk about um, the opening line. These woods were haunted, nothing wrong with it. In general, I think if you can create the feeling that something is haunted rather than stating that it was haunted, it's usually much more immersive for a reader. If you really do want to keep it though, I would just recommend like just punching up the imagery more, uh, leaning more into kind of that like urban legend tone um, is sort of set in the following paragraphs. So you could even just do like a little bit of a light uh, rewrite. That's something like people said these woods were alive. Or what else could you say? Um, as the rumors went, these woods weren't kind to intruders. Something that gives the woods a, um, a sort of like personality. One thing I really do like about this paragraph is that, you know, it starts on an anecdote. Um, I really like anecdotes to do exposition. So the fact that this is something that um, Elle hears from her dad, I almost don't even think you need the beginning part at all. I think though that something to consider is like tweaking the anecdote even further so that it's a bit more specific and a bit more weird. So I know that, um, I mean, th these are like great sensorial details with like cold hands and claw marks and stuff like that, but I would try to push like even further. You know, in this case, we kind of want to paint a very um, unsettling picture, for example. What makes something scary isn't just the physical attributes like it's also a little bit psychological can we extend the image of the cold hands or the shadowy figures or the claw marks to something beyond just physical fear uh Elle didn't believe it and she didn't think her dad really did either he wasn't the type i like this um it gives some characterization the phrase he wasn't the type was very intriguing um, why isn't he the type? Elle's dad is the one that's like telling her these stories. That made me curious because if he doesn't believe in the stories, then why does he tell them? Get like kind of giving a hint into what kind of person he is might help with that characterization. He talks a little bit here about students uh, sneaking out of their dorms. Um, does he tell them because he likes reminiscing about his college days or is he telling them as like um, kids these days, like this is what I hear in the news, you know? Even if the dad isn't a huge important character, any moment that you can make to kind of craft a more specific picture of a character can just, it can contribute to the tone of the scene. It can also do a lot for Elle's character because it might give us insight into her relationship with her dad, for example. Elle sat slumped in the back seat of the car, arms folded, legs crossed. She didn't dare talk, so every ounce of anger she felt was conveyed in how her fingers dug into her arms and the way her shins bumped against the driver's seat. The air in the car stiffened with tension. If you can play around with how you're describing her body language, the details in the car, and just other things that she's observing. You can convey her anger and you can convey the tension in the car without necessarily having to state that she was angry or that the air was tense. Elle, you're pressing into my back, Paul, her dad, said from in front of her. She pulled back a reluctant half an inch from the passenger seat, Jamie sighed, a tired, strained noise like a car sputtering. Paul gave Elle a look through the mirror. See, it said, you've made your mother upset. Elle looked away. What immediately stood out to me about this paragraph was the fact that Elle then calls her parents by their names. Um, I was so intrigued by that. I think that's a great detail. Um, I think you can even take that further. I think the detail of Elle calling her parents by their names sort of implies a lot about the tension that might exist between them. I don't know, that's the impression that I got. I'm assuming that there's like a, a difficult relationship between them. If that difficult relationship is in fact important to the story on some level, I would yeah, I would extend the use of her dad's name here and I would just call him Paul throughout the scene. Um, and then at the end, when you get this line, that's when the reader is hit with the realization that, oh, Paul is her dad. And so you immediately get that feeling of like, there's some kind of like distance in their relationship. So I did do a line edit of this scene. It's just one way to consider looking at the scene. I wrote this again, purely as example. 
and I also made a lot of assumptions, assumed certain details, I extrapolated um, certain details based on the excerpt, but I, I am aware that um, some of those assumptions could be wrong and that they might not be in line with the writer's stories. And I'm not saying to um, literally make these changes, but I just kind of made this to illustrate a couple points. One thing that I did here started with a bit of a character introduction. I acknowledge that this is a little bit my writing style and it, it might not be the writer's writing style. I think in general, if this is the opening of the novel, it might be helpful to consider doing something to characterize the characters right away, in this case Elle and her dad. The ghost stories didn't belong to Paul. Anyone who'd had the misfortune of spending more than a day or two in town had something to say about those woods. Elle had a theory that Paul didn't even believe the stories, but he liked to tell them as if they were his to tell. I added this just because I got the impression that there was some weird tension between Paul and Elle. I almost thought it would be interesting. Elle had this certain like attitude towards her dad in her internal monologue because that will immediately set the tone of their relationship. It was one of those stale suburban afternoons, spring but not the pretty kind, just sunless skies and rain and allergies. They were merging onto the freeway ramp. The trees curled into view beneath them and Paul started up again about the goddamn ghosts. So I wrote this just because I think it's nice to have at least one or two sentences that kind of set the scene because we don't know um, where they're driving to, we don't know where they're going. Um, some of those details maybe might not be important. Just trying to pick details that might contribute to our understanding of the scene or to the atmosphere. Again, you could replace this with like literally anything. This is just an example. I'll start it up again about the goddamn ghosts. I'm just making some assumptions here about Elle's personality. Um, I'm This is a YA, so I'm assuming that she's a teenager. If you can find ways to kind of like create that character voice for her, um, that might also help contribute to the scene. Um, if she isn't um, as bratty or as snappy as this, you don't have to go in that direction. But again, just an example. Uh, you know, in college, he said, drumming his fingers against the steering wheel, it was always college. If Elle had to hazard a guess, college was the last time Paul was interesting. In college, there was this buddy of mine. Again, just a, a continuation of what I was saying earlier with, um, giving Elle some personality in the in her kind of like internal thoughts. Elle knew how the rumors went. People said all sorts of things about those woods, that the trees moved when your back was turned, that their shadows could swallow you whole, their cold branches curving around your neck like hands made of ice. You went into the woods and you never came out the same way. Okay, I basically just took the same imagery, most of the same imagery, but I just tweaked it a little bit. I kind of went into second person here, like a hypothetical second person, just because I thought that that could um, build out the unsettling feeling a little bit more. Instead of focusing on things like the physical attributes, like bruises and claw marks and stuff like that, I think it just like feels a lot more like skin crawling to imagine trees following you when you're not looking, you know what I mean? It just kind of like gives you that that sort of skin prickle. Elle didn't believe the stories either, maybe she'd inherited that from Paul. Besides, she thought if ghosts were real, she didn't know that why they would stay in this town. Again, I'm making assumptions here about Elle's character. You can replace this with literally anything. So the internal conflict that I just plucked from the sky was um, maybe Elle feeling she wants to like get out of her town, get out of this situation, feeling stuck or whatever. The other thing though is I don't know if this takes place in a small town, I'm just kind of guessing. <laughs> I kind of just went like suburban small town just as a guess, but you can go in any direction. Yeah, so I just felt like using this kind of sentence as a way to hint at whatever Elle's internal struggle is might be a little bit more effective than something like this. The traffic began to slow and Elle slumped back into her seat. She rearranged herself, swinging one leg over the other. Her foot bumped the back of Paul's chair and maybe that was on purpose, but no one could prove it. The Corolla smelled like cigarettes and Jamie's floral perfume. Elle frowned, her nose itched, worse than her spring allergies. So this, um, I kind of crafted it around uh, this uh, paragraph here. So this original paragraph, we mostly just get description of Elle is like angry and she's like slumping into the back of her car. 
uh, first of all, very relatable. <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing I do want to say is I I feel like I feel like this exchange is like a very realistic and relatable exchange that you that a teenager would have with their parents. It's like very sparse, but you can feel the tension. And I'm, in this case, I'm just kind of expanding upon it. Elle accidentally like hitting her dad's car, uh, the back of her dad's seat with her foot as she's like crossing her legs. It could be like a little bit cheeky where she's like, she's doing it subtly, but not subtly. And also um, just with this last part here, you want to convey this feeling that Elle is like angry or annoyed. And I think that this is just one way to approach it where a lot of the times when we are annoyed and we are in close proximity with the person that is annoying us, a lot of the times just the fine details, just like the little things they are doing can bother us. You know, like when we're upset, everything is annoying. Paint a picture of what it feels like to be sitting in that car. Just kind of like pluck out a few details that Elle would find annoying. I just kind of like made up this detail about Elle and her spring allergies and how, you know, <laughs> Jamie's floral perfume is bothering her and it's making her spring allergies act up. It could be literally anything. The reader can extrapolate for themselves that um, what the atmosphere is without having to necessarily state it. L, Paul said, you're knocking my seat, kid. L hummed, am I? From the passenger seat, Jamie cleared her throat like the stutter stop of a whiny car engine. Paul gave L a look through the rear, rear view mirror. See, it said, you've made your mother upset. L looked away at the woods shrinking into the distance. Okay, here, um, I just kind of was like fidgeting with Paul's dialogue a little bit. And then I added this line here where Elle sounds a little bit cheeky just cause that was the tone that I was trying to set with her character. I don't know if that's in line with like the writer's tone, but whatever her personality is, it can, it can you can play around with it and see if it can come across in her dialogue and in her actions. One description I really liked was this like noise that Jamie makes, like a car sputtering. In the original, it says here that Jamie sighs. I actually think it might be hard. I it, I think it's a little bit of a stretch to, to liken a sigh to a car sputtering because a sigh is more like breathy. It's not really something that like stutters, um, but I just tweaked it to say that she clears her throat because I think it's a little bit, it like fits together a little bit more. And then in this last part here, when it says that Elle looks away, I just kind of came back to the image of the woods because we start the scene talking about the woods and then we end the scene talking about the woods. You're closing a loop. So yeah, that is just one approach. Again, I want to emphasize that anytime I do a line edit, I'm making a lot of assumptions and taking some creative liberties. So what I write out might not fit exactly the writer's like image of their story, but I hope it's helpful. Hopefully, you know, at least there's like one or two things that um, might be helpful for the readers. If you guys have any thoughts on any of the pieces, I would love to know if you guys had any like different impressions or readings of any of the excerpts. Feel free to like leave your thoughts down below because my opinion is only one opinion. I have been in workshop before and I have had one reading of a classmate's work that is like completely different from like other people's. It's always important to get more than one writer's opinion on a piece. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to more submissions. I was hoping that I could maybe like push a fourth one, but my throat is honestly killing me. I don't know how long um, this video is, but I think I have been filming for almost two hours. So <laughs> yeah, my brain's a little bit jumbled. If I did not get to your submission, keep an eye out for a future video. I will try my best to do another one. That's all. Thank you guys so much for watching to the end of this video. Again, thank you so much to the writers who let me read your work. As always, I hope your writing projects are going well, and I will see you guys in the next one.